So we're going to continue on. This is part two of Diana Palmer's Unleashed book review. And as you can see, millions points of lights. So let's pick up where we left off and see how far we get tonight, which I hope is a little bit farther because it gets harder and harder to deal with these books when they're marked up so bad. Page 63. Where did you learn to shoot a gun? He asked curiosity. My grandfather taught me about big guys, but Cal taught me how to shoot a pistol, he, she said. He took me out to the firing range and let me practice, she winced. It made my hands so sore. He said I had to learn to fire with either hand, like the FBI teaches you. He scowled. Why did he teach you? Page 64. It was just for fun, she stammered, and then she flushed. That wasn't true. Cal had started teaching her right after Morris beat her up and Tad while Morris was still living at home. Cal had even given her a little .32 caliber pistol. She assured him that she would never probably shoot anybody. He'd assured her that there were times when a gun might be the only way to save lives. And he added a writer about how Morris was drugged up half the time and dangerous to both her and Tad. That was while Morris was waiting uh, for his court case to be called, and it didn't go to trial the several months after the assault that had ha cowed Kate Clancy. I can't talk tonight. I apologize. Does he still take you out to the range, he wondered aloud, and could kick, have kicked himself for the question. Not anymore, she said. There was no need since Morris had been locked up. She handed him the bag, the cartridges, she added. He took from the bag her cold fingers. He noticed that she had pretty fingers, but that she wore no polish on them. He looked at her hair as well, and with a frown. What's wrong, she asked. You don't wear fancy nail polish or put green tips on your hair, he noticed. His black eyes began to twinkle. No tattoos, either. I don't like needles, she replied, on one side of her pretty bow mouth, pulled down and I can just see me trying to wear purple tipped hair and a tattoo in this office. The first time the lieutenant saw me I'd be standing in the unemployment line. He pursed his lips. The lieutenant has a tattoo but if you ask him where it is he turns red and he finds an excuse to leave the room. Page 65. What? Her eyes danced and she laughed. Her whole face lit up when she laughed and her pale silver eyes glimmered like the sun on steel. He smiled unconsciously at the picture she made like that. She met those searching black eyes and her face felt suddenly like her body. She was moved back a step, uncomfortable and uncertain, not really understanding why she wanted to run. Cartridges, right. Then if these don't work, he added, we shoot it. You can't shoot equipment. That's you issued to us. It's a state agency, she pointed out. I'll shoot it in a very governmental way, he promised. She couldn't help herself. She laughed. You don't do that very often, he remarked. Do what? Laugh. It's not dignified. He chuckled. Neither am I. Mostly. Okay, hold down the home front. I'll waste half a day searching for cartridges that probably won't even fit, and then I'll try to get this persnickety piece of office equipment to cooperate with me. Persnickety, she asked, her eyebrows lifted. It was my grandmother's word for anything she wanted to call a bad name, but wouldn't, he said. She was one of the first female peace officers in Wyoming. She worked as a deputy sheriff. What a fascinating person she must have been. He nodded. I was ten. She was gunned down on the job, giving out a speeding ticket to a man who turned out to be a fugitive from a murder charge. His face taunted. I think that's why I wanted to be a lawman. I couldn't, page 66, save her, but I had hoped I might save somebody else and pass it on. She understood at once. My grandfather was a deputy sheriff in the county south of here, and then in San Antonio for many years, she said. His health failed, or he probably still had been doing it, when, when we lost him, she said, amending what she started to say. Even so, he had worked as a special deputy from time to time. He loved his job. Tad's father? How did he die? Ben was hit by a speeding car, she said simply. It was so unexpected. He could be kind when he wanted to. Any family living? She hesitated. Morris was a stepbrother, not family. No, she said softly. All my people are dead. So are most of mine, he replied. I have a cousin who's sh uh, sheriff up in Wyoming. He lives in Catalau, where Brenda and I are from. He sighed. He's had a hard life himself. His wife was a doctor. She caught a deadly virus while treating a patient. She died. Cody never got that. Er, 
got, got over that, sorry. He keeps to himself. He said that he would rather have the memory than half a dozen modern man-hating women. She sighed. That's so sad. He looked at her until he, she raised her eyes. You don't date, do you? Most men wouldn't understand why I've taken to Tad. I'd have to take Tad with me if I went on a date, she said, and her eyes twinkled. It's a hell of a lot of responsibility, he said quietly. You've taken care of him for how long? Since I was 19, she said. I love my brother, she added quietly. I'd do anything to keep him safe. Page 67. He nodded. I've taken care of my sister since she was only a little older than Tad. I understand the lack of a social life, he chuckled. I had to take her on dates, too, because I had nobody to leave her with. Odd how it puts women off. I guess it would put off men, too, she mused. His black eyes narrowed. Don't you know? She grimaced. I sort of had a bad experience, she hesitated. I don't trust men. It shows, he said. She shall swallowed sorry. It wasn't an accusation, he cocked his head as he stared down at her. Was he prosecuted? She was more... She moved resistively. Yes, but you can't get past the memory. She studied his lean, strong face. Not really. She confessed on a sigh. Men scare me. Which explains the bullet hole in the volunteer deputy's foot, he added. He was really aggressive. She folded her arms across her chest. Cal taught me some martial art moves, but he, had, he said never to confront a man that I could run from. He said that no matter how well you can do these moves in a studio, it's different with a, a real attacker. He said that overconfidence gets a whole lot of women killed. It does, he returned. A man on drugs or drunk on alcohol is hard to take down. Even for men or women exist in martial arts training. Most law enforcement agencies have women who work there. Do martial arts really work for them? In desperate situations, ones where they might be killed if, it, if they can't counterattack, they usually reach for, page 68, a stun gun or a pistol or a riot gun. If the other lives are in jeopardy, he replied, a little woman is hard-pressed to subdue a man twice her size, even with ongoing instructions. We had a perp killed a few years ago with a ver that very reason. The officer, who was a female, had broken two ribs, torn a rotator cuff after she tried a stun gun, which didn't stop the perp from beating her half to death. She was barely able to get her firearm out in time to save her life. Not that the male officers don't occasionally get put in the same situation. He smiled. Not all men are six foot five and muscular, he added. I don't ever want to wear a badge, she said quietly. It's not a bad life, certainly not as demanding as the military. She drew in a breath. She sounded raspy. I guess it wouldn't be. You've got a good job here. Why were you thinking about the military, he persisted. She bit her lower lip. Well, see, the house we live in belongs to Tad's half-brother. If he ever comes back here to live, we'll have to find somewhere else to go. He scowled. Why? Isn't he family, too? She swallowed, tad scared of him. He started to ask another question when his phone exploded with sound. He pulled it out of his holster, irritated at the interruption. Banks, he said shortly. What? Oh, no, I hadn't forgotten, he said. The damn printer ran out of ink just as I started to print out a letter I needed to send today. So now I have to go find cartridges for the damn thing. Yes, I know. I'll be there in ten minutes. No problem. He hung up. He glared at the printer. Page 69. If you shoot it, they'll take your gun away, she said, reading his expression. He sighed. They probably would, all right. I'll feed it two new cartridges when I get back. He paused at the door and looked over at her one broad shoulder. But I'm not talking to it. He went out and slammed the door behind him. Clancy went back into her own office and chided herself for almost spilling the beans about Morris. It was a good thing that she had her grandfather and didn't share that same last name as Morris and Ben Duffy, as it was her grandfather's last name that was on the police report that Banks was going by. It wasn't the same as Glan Clancy's either. She felt guilty for not mentioning it. It made her feel good that Banks was looking for her grandfather's assailant. He probably assumed that Clancy's grandfather was dead. She imagined it was true. Morris had almost certainly killed the old man, who was trying to, very hard to connect Morris with a group of local drug dealers. Clancy agonized over that what had really happened to him. She hoped it was quick, at least, and that he hadn't suffered. But she knew that he was never coming back home. She hoped that Banks could dig up enough evidence to charge Morris, even if was never convicted. It was a shame that that kind old man was gone without a trace, and that nobody was held accountable for his disappearance. 
Bank came back much later with two ink cartridges, the right kind, and Clancy put them in for him. But when he started the print come in and the printer promptly ate two sheets of paper and jammed, not a word, he said, pointing a finger at her. I didn't say anything, she said defensively. He stood in front of the printer and his black eyes narrowed. It's just a paper jam, she said, easing around him to open the printer and unstick the papers inside. She fixed them in a paper holder and stepped back. Try it now, she said. He went to the computer, muttering to himself. She leaned over. You're a very nice machine, she whispered. Come on, now make me proud. He pushed a button and the letter was printed and dropped into the tray. He picked it up and studied it. Not bad, he murmured. I told you, she replied, crossing her arms over her chest. It worked because I threatened to shoot it, he told her. It worked because I told it how nice it was, she retorted. Page 70. Page 80 and maybe 81. Did you, you tell my sister that you were sweet on me? She looked at him as if he'd suddenly grown two heads and bat wings. He rolled his eyes. Never mind. I thought she was making it up. He made a face. She's trying to set me up with anybody she can think of before Grace gets to town. Grace? It was a name she recognized from what she overheard Brenda say once. Banks was carrying a torch for the woman. And it hurt. She couldn't understand why. Grace Charles, and it's none of your business, he added shortly with a sharp glare. She flushed. Well, excuse me. I was making conversation, not prying into your personal phone, he interrupted. She glared at him. He was closer to it than she was. With a long-suffering sigh, she went to answer it. That was page 81. Page 82. Banks' sister won't give me the pass key to his apartment, Cal Hollister said when she answered her cell phone that night. She won't. She asked, why do you want one? I'm going to short sheet his bed and put salt in his sugar shaker. Not nice, she chided, and you're the captain of a police department, too. I told Daryl, and he spelled his first name for me to make sure I knew that it had two R's and two I's, that if I wanted, he wanted after-hours protection, he could come pull my officers himself. I bet that's not all, you told him, she mused. There was a few incentives and unprintable words as well, he said with a chuckle. I did tell him that I put a note on the bulletin board, hence the careful spelling of his name and he gave, that he gave me. She laughed. How are you and Tad? Doing well. Your voice sounds raspy. Are you using that preventative, he asked. Don't start, she chided. I just sound hoarse. My lungs are clear, and yes, I'm using it. I miss you, he sighed. Your replacement just smiles and does her job. She never calls me names or tries to set me up on dates with street walkers when I try to ask her to work overtime, she asked. Or she laughed. I miss you, too, she said, but I can walk to and from work, and you're not too far away. I could drive you both. You're sweet, but I like being independent. You can be too independent, he said quietly. She was uncomfortable at this note in his voice. Okay, what's going on, she asked. There was a pause. The parole board met today. 82, 83, 84. Her heart stopped. And? And it looks like Morris will be getting out the week after next. And her whole life flashed before her eyes. She could actually see her heart beating in her eyes and stared blankly at the other wall and felt blood drain out of her face. Don't panic, he said abruptly. It's not the end of the world. Banks doesn't know about Morse. He doesn't know why that he's trying to find out what happened to my grandfather. He doesn't know. Why haven't you told him? I could lose my job, Cal, she said. My stepbrother is a convicted felon. You won't lose your job. Many people have relatives who have been in trouble with the law. Most of them aren't employed by the Texas Rangers, she said, especially Coulter Banks, who doesn't even want me to work for him in the first place. He wanted a man. He said so, but no men applied, so he got stuck with me. He did choose you out of a field of four women, he pointed out. Right. You didn't see what he had to choose from, she sighed. He chuckled, but I heard about it. I understand that he was of the opinion that the other three made their living at night on the street corners. Shame. So you were the best of the lot. He hates me. Probably not. Tad will die when I tell him, she said. He's terrified of Morris after all this time. Page 85. So are you, kid, he said gently. She drew in a breath. What am I going to tell him? Don't tell him anything. Not yet. We can't stay where we are. I won't live with Morris. Neither will Tad. I'll look around for apartments. Can you find one for $10 a month? Because that's what I can afford, she said, with and not altogether fastidiously. Stop that, he said. What about Martins? 
You've been wheeling round old Mar Mr. Martin for to church for ages. I won't put them in danger, she said solemnly. Morris is vindictive. I guess I'd forgotten that, he said apologetically. I hadn't, she said. If worse comes to worse, you and Tad can come living with me. I'll have Miss Betsy and her sister move in, and to, also to keep you from making nasty remarks about it. You have a life of your own. Some life, he said heavily. The walls close in from time to time, and I'm too much alone. You should marry again, she said. No, I shouldn't, he said shortly. Once was enough. The world is full of nice women. What about that Marquez mother? She's wonderful. Fred Harris. I thought they were just friends. So did a lot of people, he remarked. Besides, Barbara isn't my type. Who is? He was quiet. There was one long ago. She did something that destroyed my faith in her, and I married on the rebound, page 86, to show her that I didn't give a damn about her. There was that hollow laugh again, and finally backfired well, years of hell, until my wife finally drugged herself to death, and then I lived with the guilt because she drugged herself to death. Love is overrated, she pointed out. He burst out laughing. And how would you know that? She sighed. I guess I wouldn't. I've never been in love, well, except for that dreamy guy in the movie that I love, she added. A fairy tale, just your style, kid. Why don't you take a good look at that tall, dark, handsome guy you work for? Banks, she exclaimed. Are you nuts? I'd rather date a frog. How odd that he said the same thing about you. She fumed silently. Stings, doesn't it, he added. Only burns just a little, she retorted. I'll see what I can find out about the rentals and get back to you as soon as I can. I guess I could sneak back into the office after hours with Tad and Bunker down there, she laughed. You'd be found out by Banks. He doesn't miss much. It, it's what makes him good at his job. I suppose. Well, thanks. I appreciate all you've done for me and Tad. I don't do anything I don't want to. You know that. I never had a kid sister until you came along. She smiled. That's nice. I never had a big brother until you came along. She didn't claim Morris as her big brother, despite the fact that he was her stepbrother. You've done a great job with Tad, he said abruptly. He's a good kid. I think so, too. I've done my best. We don't have a lot, but he's never wanted for love and attention. Or discipline, he added with a chuckle, taking away his only video game for a week for fighting at school with sheer genius. You're only saying it because it was your idea, she pointed out. I have ego issues, he said. Marquez's wife keeps upstaging me on the shooting range. Only by one point, she said, and I think Gwen really tries to miss. Honest. He sighed. She's a sweet woman. I had a brief crush on her before Marquez walked in or waltzed off with her. I like blondes, he chuckled. That's because you're a blonde, too, she suggested. Who knows? Wear that ratty jacket to work tomorrow. It's going to be cold, very cold. What are you and Tad planning to do for Thanksgiving, he added. Her blood froze. Morse would probably be out by then. Why don't you come over here for it, he said. I don't have a family. It'd be nice to have, not to have to eat alone. She knew what he meant. He wasn't just being kind. She smiled to herself. We both like that very much, and you do have family. You have me and Tad. There was a hesitation. Thanks, kid. The victim service should be let me know when Morris is getting out, but just in case, would you too? Of course. You take care of yourself. I'll be fine. You do the same. That was 86, 87. Moving forward. Okay, I'm trying to see how far this one goes. Okay, right here, she's about to get sick at work, and her boss finds out that she's sick, and he takes care of her. Oh, it's good. The door snapped shut and Banks came down the steps. What are you laughing about, he asked. Agent Murdoch, she said, and laughed some more. God, he snorted. If you, I ever have to speak to that John Blackhawk on a case, I'll take my own coffee once he even tried to buy it from me. I'm not surprised, she returned. He stuck his head in the doorway and frowned. What's wrong with you, he asked suddenly. Her eyebrows arched. What do you mean, she asked innocently and ruined the pose by coughing so hard that her chest hurt and sighed. You're sick, he said. She swallowed. I am not, she argued. It's just a cough. He moved closer. It's not. What's wrong with you? I got chilled, she said stubbornly. He put his big lean hand out and felt her forehead. The frown got worse. Clancy, you're burning up with fever. Let's go. No. Yes. Do you want me to pick you up and carry you out of here, he added. You wouldn't dare, she said haughtily. Page 92. Moving on to page 93. 
Stop struggling or I'll drop you, he muttered as he reached for the SUV. He balanced her on one upraised thigh and then he opened the door as he pushed her inside and closed the door on her furious muttering. He got her inside her, fasten your... He glanced at the, her. Good girl, he cranked the SUV. Who's your doctor? She swallowed hard. I go to the nurse practitioner on Saturdays at Fred Pharmacy. He looked at her, shocked. You don't have a doctor? She bit her lower lip and fought tears. He recalled where she lived and how she lived. Stupid question, he chided himself. He turned the truck toward Howe Marshall Memorial Hospital. I can't afford this, she exclaimed as he marched her slowly into the emergency room. And I can't afford to have you die, he returned. They won't give me anybody to replace you. I'll have to teach your ghost how to type. Mr. Banks, she protested. He signed her in. The clerk who knew him raised her eyebrow and then glanced past him at a red-faced, sickly Clancy and nodded. Bring her over and let's get some information, then we'll get her right in. Clancy gave the clerk the information, her insurance card. They did have great insurance at work, and maybe she could take Tad and flee to another country before the bill came due for what insurance wouldn't pay. The form was filled out, and a nurse came for Clancy. She escorted her back to the room for a few minutes later. Smiling technician came to draw blood. The doctor came in long enough to ask her a couple questions and listen to her chest. He grimaced and ordered an x-ray, then went back, back out again. After an almost hour later, she was diagnosed with pneumonia, given two prescriptions, sent back out into the waiting room. She wondered how she would get back to the office when she saw Banks sitting there patiently waiting for her. She burst into tears. He'd been impatient, irritable, insulting, all sorts of things over the month that she worked for him, but when she was sick, here he was, taking care of her when nobody else would have faulted him for leaving her and going back to work. He got up and went to her. What's wrong? He said in the softest, deep, gentle tone she'd ever heard from him. She swallowed a sob. It's so kind. I just thought you'd go back to work, she sobbed. And leave you here alone to find your own way home, he added. She looked up at him and her weather wet cheeks glistening pale silver eyes, and she fell in love just that quickly. That was page 92, 93, 94. Okay. Moving forward to page 96. I'm trying to see how far we're going to go this evening. Okay, we'll go to page 100. We're at 96 right now. He tilted up her rounded chin and studied her flush, fever flush face. Why didn't you tell me you had asthma? He added, asked suddenly. How, how did you know? She faltered. One of the techs was discussing your x-ray with the doctor. I overheard them, he scowled. He said there was evidence of two broken ribs as well. Oh, those, she said quickly. I had a, a fall recently, several years ago. She didn't want to elaborate on how her ribs had been broken. That would lead to Morris and questions she didn't want to answer. You shouldn't be walking to work with your lungs in that short of shape, he said sternly. She managed a shallow breath. Well, the limousine service won't transportate me with a Ferrari sitting in my driveway. He burst out laughing. She grinned. I can't afford a car. They break down. They have to get gas. It's not feasible. Cabs run, he reminded her. So do limousines. Say di same difference page 97. She was making a point that he understood. She couldn't afford cabs. Cal offered to bring me back and forth to work when his office moved, but I wouldn't let him. It's an imposition, she explained. The idea of Hollister wanting to protect her made him uncomfortable, and he didn't know why. Her predicament seemed to be without any sort of resolution. He scowled because it bothered him. She looked so fragile. I'll be fine. I'll come to work tomorrow. You will not, he said, or you'll be... I'll set fire to your desk and let you explain it to the lieutenant. You wouldn't dare, she returned indignantly. He paused and he chiseled his lips with his black eyes twinkling. You don't know me, kid, he replied. There isn't much I wouldn't dare. I'll stay home for two days. The medicine will be working by then. Your lungs will be dicey for a few weeks. That's a bacterial pneumonia, not walking pneumonia. He had that from the doctor himself. How do you know that they'll be dicey, she wanted to know. I had pneumonia once a few years ago, he said solemnly. It laid me flat out for a week. I was even in the hospital a few days. I haven't forgotten the recovery period. One side of the pretty bow on his mouth pulled down. I have it every year. Believe me, I know the recovery period. Every year, he asked, surprised. 
Nobody knows why. I avoid sick people. I take vitamin C. I can do all I can to stay healthy. Nothing seems to work. She stared at the spotless white shirt. Cal protected me when I worked for him. I was out a lot before I got the new medicines. He wouldn't let me. He, he wouldn't let them fire me. They probably should have. She sighed, wincing when it hurt. I'm not robust. No, but you're efficient. You don't goof off. You don't complain about your working overtime if you have to. You don't even fuss when I make coffee. She looked back into his soft black eyes. You make terrible coffee. He smiled. I know. She clutched the bag of medicines. Well, well, what about your brother? He asked. Don't you walk him? Uh, don't you walk by the school to pick him up? She nodded. I'll ask Cal. He won't mind dropping Tad off where we live on his way home anyway. He has a ranch down near Comanche Wells, she said. I know I live in Jacob County, too. She had known that. Cal punches or runs pro. Cal runs pur purebred Angus cattle. He cocked his head and his eyes narrowed. You know a lot about him. He was my boss for four years, she pointed out. He made a sound in his throat. She didn't know what it meant. All right, then. I'll get back to work. Call me if you need to know about any files I'm working on, she said. I'll keep the phone with me. I'll do that. Go to bed. She smiled. Yes, sir, he chuckled and as he went out the door. She, that's page 98-99. She took the first doses of her medicine, got into her pajamas, and went straight to bed. She phoned Cal. I hate to ask, she began, but can I bring Tad home for you? He finished for her with a chuckle. Sure, no problem. How? she stammered. Banks mentioned that you were sick. He was in the office to see Marquez, he added. He took me to the hospital. I didn't want to go, she sighed. He said that, too. I imagine that there will be some gossip at the hospital, considering the way you arrived, he added, tongue-in-cheek. Well, I refused to go, she said defensively. So he carried you in, he chuckled. Leave it to Banks. He said you showed up at work sick as a dog and never said a word about it. I told him that's the way you always were. You came to work regardless. I didn't want to get fired. Her voice was getting more hoarse by the minute. Stop talking and take a nap. He told her gently, I'll pick Tad up and bring him home. What do you want for supper? And I'll bring that too. Cal, she fussed. Just tell me or I'll ask Tad. That would mean pizza and she couldn't stand it. Soup, she murmured. What sort? I don't care. He chuckled. Okay, soup it is. Want one of those Greek parfaits with yogurt and fruit granola? That sounds heavenly. Thought I remembered those preferences. I'll bring them. Get better, he hung up. She lay there staring at the ceiling, propped up on two pillows, and on a third pillow she could hold to her chest when she had to cough. She remembered Banks carrying her in and out of the hospital, the way it felt, the tenderness in his black eyes, and her heart raced. She never thought of Coulter Banks as anything except a grumpy boss before, but it suddenly became difficult to put him back into that perspective. She was recalling spicy aftershave, strong arms, a muscular chest pressed against her, a square chin resting on top of her short, wavy, dark hair. It had a moment of time when she felt safe, warm, and cared for. She caught her breath as those sensations she watched over her in her memory. She moved restlessly in bed. She had to get her feelings under control before she went back to work. It wouldn't have done for Banks to notice how she felt about him. She had to be careful. He thought of her as a kid. He even called her that. He was a kind man, but his kindness was, had been impartial. She had to try to remember that. And that was page 100. And we'll start at page 101 tomorrow. Thank you for joining me for part two of Unleashed. I don't know if we'll finish it tomorrow. Um, I don't know how much I'll get to read to you tomorrow, but we'll get there. <laughs> make sure you're keeping your social distance, washing your hands. When you can't wash your hands, make sure you're using your hand sanitizer. And most importantly, people, wear your mask. Love each and every one of you. Thank you for watching and God bless.